Okay, everyone, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Can y'all hear me? You good? I think I've been on a plane this weekend, so like my eyes are watering like crazy. I can't hear anything. So if you come and talk to me and I'm just smiling, that's why. Um, we're really glad you guys are here. Uh, we are going quick through introductions, quick through welcomes, because we want to give our speakers who we've flown in, who are driving in, who almost all of them have their doctorates, we're giving them the most time to talk and share knowledge. And so we are so thankful you're here. Um, I see lots of familiar faces. I see a few that I don't know. My name is Abby Carr, and I serve as our children's minister. Um, and today you have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Beth Robinson. So in case you don't know, Dr. Beth Robinson is a professor of counseling at Colorado Christian University. Before coming to CCU, Dr. Beth served in a variety of academic roles at Lubbock Christian University, where she served as Director of Graduate Studies, Chair of Behavioral Sciences, and Assistant Prov Provost. I don't even, that's too academic for me. She taught in both undergrad and grad programs with in-seat students and online students. Dr. Robinson has also worked as an affiliate faculty member at Harding University, Texas Tech, and Liberty University. In addition to her academic work, she brings more than 35 years of experience working with kids. When in a counseling session, she'll be listening to the story of a traumatized child at the Texas Girls and Boys Rancher explaining the process of foster care or adoption to an anxious parent. Occasionally, you'll find Dr. Robinson on the witness stand providing an expert opinion about a traumatized child. Every chance Dr. Robinson gets to leave the country, you'll find her working in an orphanage and training caregivers how to work with traumatized children. She doesn't like boredom. She loves children and has committed her time and energy to make sure they stay safe. She's written several books, articles, presented at state, regional, and national conferences. She loves having the chance to teach others through her writings and presentations, and she loves being able to teach at CCU. So just a side note before I pray for Dr. Robinson, I have known her from afar. I think I geeked out, fangirled her last year at one of our conferences, and she didn't even remember it. Like, I talked to her on the plane last night about it, and I had to, like, pull up my picture. That's how much I, like, fangirled over her. But she is one of those ladies who really, you guys, I want to be like. Um, she cares so deeply about her kids, about their health, and about following Jesus. Um, she's just a brilliant mentor, example, so fun. I hope you get to meet her after. But I'm going to pray for her, and I'm going to turn the mic over to her. So, holy God, we come before you, and I'm just thankful for today. And I pray that your words will just radiate and speak through Dr. Beth. We're thankful she came all the way from Texas to be with us. Um, holy Spirit, we ask that you just use her words to minister to people in the audience, including myself today. God, we thank you that we're a family um, and that you love us well. It's in your son, Christ, and we pray. Amen. Everyone, welcome Dr. Beth. And this is Ellie. Uh, uh, Ellie the elephant. I, I'm, I'm going to sit Alita the elephant right here in her own personal chair. Um, it might make me want to go back to Kenya a little too much. Um, I replaced my knee six weeks ago, so let's see if I can stand for all of this or not. We're going we're gonna to go for trying to stand because I have a lot of energy when I speak. Um, when it comes to mental health issues with children, I will be on task some and off task some. Uh, I put together all these slides. I'll email them all to you, and then I'm going to follow up and send you a handout about strategies to use with your kids. It's like five pages long of, I mean, practical things you can do with your kids. Um, what we do know is that mental health issues have skyrocketed among children and adolescents post-pandemic. Uh, but part of it was pre-pandemic. We saw, like, depression rise from 8% of the population of teens to almost 15% from 2008 to 2018. So we already saw a rise in the situations. And there are lots of things that are contributing to uh, what we're seeing as uh, mental health issues in children. Part of it is they're much more socially isolated, which happened during the pandemic. But the other thing that happened during the pandemic is we became very screen dependent. Okay, lots of kids on screens and lots of parents on screen. Lots of losses during the pandemic, lots of caregivers, um, loss of 
um, sense of normalcy, loss of sense of safety. We have a lot of kids now who are just waiting for it to happen again. They fear that they're going to be isolated again. So all of that. Um, so we're seeing all these mental health issues in kids. And I can give you lots of reasons, but I'm going to go off on two or three things up front. And the first one is screen time. What we know about screen time, and that's not this presentation, but what we know about screen time is when kids are on screens on social media, and this is true for you as adults, so some of you may also need to develop an abstinence program seriously for your technology. What we know is when you're using screens and you're using social media, shopping or gaming, and that's not just the big video games, that's your little games that you play that are... I don't know, because I don't play any. Um, Tetris was the last thing I played in the last century. So, um, literally, that was last century. My doctorate's also from last century, if you want to question its validity, okay? <laughs> but when you, when you engage in any of those activities, you spike the pleasure hormones in your brain, the feel-good hormones in your brain. So you do feel good when you're doing that. And those feel-good hormones encourage you, or neurotransmitters is what they really are, they encourage you to keep right on doing it. And they designed social media and gaming like gambling to keep you coming back for more. It's the same mechanism. It was designed that way on purpose. You can go read up on people who designed Facebook, for instance, and how they put in the like button and things, things similar to that so that it would create this pleasure sensation. So the downside is, when you get off of it, the pleasure hormone goes away, and I mean rapidly, you, f you feel depressed and irritable in the same day. So when somebody comes into me and says, my kid's bipolar, and I say, what do you mean by that? Their mood's everywhere. Okay, let's talk about their technology use. So... Some of you may need to join a support group, I'm not really kidding about that, about your own technology use. If you're somebody who can't put it down, okay, I don't like it, my phone is in my pocket, I don't like it because it's a leash. That's how I feel about my phone. But if your kids are using a lot of technology, you need to know what you're doing to their brains. So, everybody discouraged with me now already, ready to throw things at me? So we have really got to back off of our technology to help the mental health of our kids. There are some psychiatrists now who will not put a child who is anxious or depressed on any medication until they have been off of all technology for a minimum of two weeks. I want you to hear that. It impacts the brain that much. Okay, a second thing that is really impacting the brain of your kids is how you're feeding them. And I am not a health nut. I am a third-generation rancher. I still ranch, okay? I grew up eating, you know, steak, potatoes, green beans, you know, and the rolls that come with it, all the things. But the difference is, while that's not an outstanding diet that I grew up on, it's very different than the diets that our kids are growing up on today. So what we know is... For your kids' brains to function correctly, you have to feed their guts correctly. Everybody hear that? You have to give them real food in their stomachs for them to produce the neurotransmitters their brains need to regulate their emotions. Okay? Real foods, the, the rule is, they're the outside aisle at the grocery store. Okay? Okay? Things that are processed and fast foods do not give children's stomachs what they need to produce the neurotransmitters their brains need to manage anxiety and depression. I want you to think about that. So there, there are outside environmental things that are causing mental health issues that mean all of these issues could be addressed. The third thing is your kids need to move more. Okay, I'm an, I'm an old coach, old PE teacher. Your kids need to move more. When I had my knee surgery, they said to me, you have to get up and walk five minutes every hour. 
okay, that was painful right after knee surgery. But I try to do, it may not be every hour, but I work at home. I work at a desk. I get up pretty regularly and walk around my house, get up and move. I try to change my laundry out, do things like that just to get up and move. I'm not saying you have to make your kids Olympic athletes, but they need movement. Okay, so I've talked about three things that underlie a lot of mental health issues we're seeing with teens before we talk about things that are out of our control. Technology use, food they eat, activity. Which also means you have to change your technology use, your food, your activity. If you're active, your kids are active. They're going to go do things with you. So having said that, have you completely walled me off already? Going to ignore everything I say. There are other things that are impacting it. For instance, we know the onset of puberty is ha happening much earlier. That may be due to what we're feeding our kids to. But with the onset of puberty, sometimes as early as 10, 9, I mean, those are the ages I'm seeing with the kids I'm working with, all of a sudden they have all of these hormones that we used to see kids start having two to three years later when they had better brain development. Okay, so that's hitting earlier. The other thing that's really impacting mental health with kids is the number of social interactions you're having with your children. I, I remember all, all my kids are direct loans, is what I say from God. They're all foster adopt kids. And I started out with out-of-control teenagers because that's where they needed people to take kids. And I can remember when I first got teenagers, I felt like all I was was a taxi cab driver. You know, all I was doing was taking them places. But back then, I like to say 1902, we uh, talked when we were in the car because we didn't have technology. So the kids would get in the car, and I used to teach parents, you know, use your car time because they're a captive audience and they can't escape, and you drive and act like you're just partially paying attention. So if it's a really tough subject, driving in the car is a great time to address it. Except now, what do we do in a car? Screens. Screens or headphones and music, right? So some research by, his name is Bruce Perry, and this is a couple of years old, so it may be even worse now, was that the typical 18-year-old was having as many social interactions by age 18 as previous generations had by age 6. Okay, what that means is, they are socially isolated, and we're socially isolating them in our families because they're not getting enough of us talking to them, making eye contact. The part of your brain that teaches you how to do emotional regulation requires that you have social interaction for it to develop. So imagine what it was like for me as a college professor when I was teaching undergrads to have 18-year-olds come to my class who had the social skills of previous generations of six-year-olds. Okay? If you think it hasn't changed, it has changed. And it's changed because we're not intentional about social interactions with our kids. Um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there, there was one factor that was a preventative factor for almost everything that was risky for teenagers. So I could come speak to parents and I could say, if you do this one thing, if you do this one thing consistently... It's going to improve outcomes for your kids. It's going to reduce drug use, pregnancy, all these other things. And that thing was eating dinner together. Eating dinner together used to be it. Because what it signified was a family who was having a lot of social interaction. And the kids had a sense of belonging. Okay? So, how, does, how do meals work in your household? When I grew up in 1902, almost that long ago, my dad fixed breakfast every morning and everybody sat at the table and ate breakfast. My dad fixed breakfast because he went to work an hour later than my mom did and probably because he was a better cook. Okay? What does breakfast look like now for most of us? Anybody want to confess? Somebody confess who doesn't have kids in your home. What's breakfast like? Everybody sits down, drinks coffee, has a discussion, spends 30 minutes together? No. No, we're grab and go, aren't we? In fact, even supper a lot of time look, looks like what? Everybody coming in on a different schedule? 
there may be a meal prepared, but everybody's coming in on a different schedule and grabbing food. Am I right? So part of this is slowing things down so we have social interactions with our kids. And I am going to tell you that I work with a group of kids because I've always worked with foster and adoptive kids. I work with a group of kids where they, they have never had a parent's face light up whenever they climb in the car after school or a parent's face light up when they come in a door and when they come home. And what I want to say to you is your kids deserve to have your face light up and you'd be excited to see them and to listen to what has happened to their day. Okay, here's what you may see whenever we talk about mental health issues. Number one is isolation of your kids because what's happened now is a lot of kids would, act, they, they come home and they just go to their rooms because they get on some sort of technology and they're interacting with their friends via technology and they would rather do that than interact with parents. And so that's happening younger and younger. You may see sadness, anxiety, irritability is a huge one. Irritability may be what you see. Anger, uh, lots of use of technology, and I'm calling it developmental delays. All this inability to socially interact and be able to have a conversation, um, be able to share what they're feeling, what's good about the day, what they would change about the day, very fundamental things that they don't have. Um, so, it's interesting that research says 55% of children experienced emotional abuse during the pandemic. 55%. I'm going to tell a story that, was, uh, that also led into physical abuse, and this is pre-pandemic. Um, I, I was asked to see these kids after this. There were two young kids, they were like four and five, who were adopted by a young couple, or they were about to be adopted. They were in the six months before adoption. And um, what happened is both parents worked from home. And like I said, this was 10 or 15 years ago. Both parents were working from home. The kids got out of school for summer. And the parents had not ever raised kids before, but they were expecting the kids to be quiet, quiet while they worked. Without a babysitter, just four and five years old, go entertain yourself, and, you know, you should be able to stay quiet. And what happened is they raised the punishment level to the point that the kids were living in the garage with no food because they kept removing stuff thinking they could motivate the kids to be quiet while they were working. By the time the kids were removed, one of them was in uh, ICU, starved. Uh, th there's a great outcome to that story that another experienced adoptive family came back, took them, they're thriving. I see pictures of them all the time. But what I'm saying is, I think inadvertently some of us did that on a smaller level with the pandemic when we had to come home and work. And we were trying to work, and our kids were supposed to be doing schoolwork, and we had all of this stuff going on. And we were kind of like, go take care of it. you got to go take care of it. i got to take care of my work. you got to take care of your schoolwork. Any of that happen? Come on, it did. Okay, it was tough on me during the pandemic because I had a freshman in high school who was special education living with me, needed lots of assistance, and they didn't have a good online program. I had to go to 11 websites to help him complete his homework. It took three and a half hours a day of me sitting side by side with him. All right, some of you did not have three and a half hours a day to sit with your kids. But what happened is, some of this emotional abuse and neglect was we were trying to focus on getting our adulting done and didn't have time to do our parenting, if that makes sense. I don't think anybody did it viciously. It's just, it was overwhelming. So one of the main things I want to tell you is you have to manage yourself to raise emotionally healthy kids. And so we're going to talk about how do you manage yourself as a parent I love this um, passage in Ephesians. It often gets misquoted, but what we want to do is not provoke our kids, I'm going to say, not just to anger, but to strong emotion repeatedly. Instead, we should be encouraging them, nurturing them, and in that they find God with being portrayed through our lives as their parent. Remember, kids who are parented by you <laughs> will believe God is like you.
because God is a father and you are a parent. My very first boss coming out of college told me to never talk to her about church ever. Her dad had, her dad had been a Church of Christ preacher nearly um, beat her to death with a hairbrush one day. Okay, And she said, that whole God is a father thing, I know what a father's like and I don't want one. And you think about the impact you have on your kids because you are the embodiment of how they see God. So, some pretty simple, simple being the first word, instructions for you as parents. Okay? You need to give up your lecturing, especially if you, uh, those of you who have teenagers, if you're environmentally conscious, save the oxygen. Okay? Okay? The minute you raise your voice... Your kids go from their frontal lobe back here to the reptilian brain, and they don't process anything you say. Think about that. When you raise your voice, your kids quit processing what you're saying. Maybe you feel better, but I'll tell you, why don't you just go to the car and say all the things you're going to say to yourself instead of saying it to your kid, okay? Your kids can't process it when your voice is raised and when you use too many words. The younger a kid is, the fewer words you need to use. And you need to be calm. You need to be calm as you interact with your kids. They can't navigate the world. They're asking you to co-regulate and help them navigate the world. Um, and I, like I said, no lectures. Redirections are three to five sentences. Okay? And if redirection doesn't work, it's because you're doing it wrong. I, I'm just going to step on your toes and tell you, you're doing it wrong. You can get kids to do what you want them to do, you just have to use the term consequences. That's not punishment. Consequences. All of your children who have phones, grandchildren who have phones, I think God allows children to have phones because they're so motivational. Somebody laughing about that? They are. You know, phones are, car keys are, screen time is, all those things. So... The, the key is you have to find a consequence that's meaningful for your kids. That's positive and negative. So, for instance, um, the American Pediatric Association says all children under 18 should be limited to one hour a day of screen time. One hour. Okay? So a consequence, see, this could be positive, is if you take care of all of your chores on Saturday, you can have an extra hour of screen time. That's a consequence. It's a positive consequence. We know positive consequences work better. If your kids aren't picking up their rooms and keeping their rooms straight, it's your fault. You have not sufficiently motivated them. You go to your jobs and you do what you're supposed to do at your jobs. Why? You'll get fired or you'll get paid. Okay? Most of you want the money in your paycheck because you want the things the money will get you. We teach the same concepts to our kids with consequences when they're young. We, we teach them, you know, if you take care of your room, here's the consequence. If you don't, here's the consequence. I, uh, the, the only ministry job I have had in a church, I was hired to be a director of a counseling ministry, but they had me run very first thing. Support group for parents of teens. I had some parents in there who had just had a son leave their home to go to college. And I am not kidding when I tell you this story. They used a scoop shovel to go in and clean out his room and had to strip out all the flooring because he had allowed so much trash and stuff to accumulate in his room. Okay? I am not an amazing housekeeper myself, okay? I grew up with a mom who hired a housekeeper because there were four of us kids in four and a half years and she couldn't do it all. I think that's a great strategy, but I am huge on making your beds and picking your stuff up. So I inherited my dad. He used to go through the house at night and he would pick up everything that was left out and then he would charge us chore money to get our own clothes back, okay? That's my kind of motivation. So I grew up with that. I don't think anybody leaves the house in the morning without your bed made and your room picked up. And the amazing thing is I don't raise my voice to get it to happen. And my kids now are 19 to 39, so I'm not as far away from parenting teens as you might think I am. So 
you, you can make it happen. You have to be intentional. It takes a little more time. Um, the best technique when your kids are upset, so um, my 19-year-old wrecked his car the day before I left to go to NCYM, so on this trip. So he wrecked his car. So guess what he kept texting me about? I, I didn't pick up the phone for the phone call, I'll be honest. I'd, I'd say, you've got to text me because, you know, I'm on the plane, I'm speaking, I'm whatever. So what do you think his solution was to him having wrecked his car? Drive mine. Yes. He wanted to drive my car. So I would just say, no, you can't drive my car. We'll talk about this when I get home. So he'd text another time. I would say, I would copy the message, send it again. Okay? There, there is something to being, whenever I say broken record, it's not a broken record of lectures, because I really did see a teenager one time who numbered her mother's lectures. She could say, oh, it was lecture seven on da-da-da-da. And she could actually do the lectures in her mother's voice. It was pretty cool. But that's, the broken record is not about the lecture. It's about a simple restatement redirection. No, you can't take my car. We'll talk about it when I get home. Same response consistently. Same response consistently. Because he's going to have to, uh, he totaled his car out. He, he doesn't know what all that means financially, but he's going to have to earn some money and do some things to pay that off. Because I'm that kind of parent. I'm that kind of parent. I'm also, just so you know this, and this is not part of just the whole mental health thing, but I'm also an intrusive parent. I believe in intrusive parenting. So if you're younger and you think this is not cool because other parents don't do it, well, be cool like me. Okay, be a nerd. Um, even before there was all the technology to follow kids around because I'm in counseling. So, for instance, um, I saw a girl whose parents knew, I mean, she was like 14 or 15, that she was dating a guy that was 26 and trying to have sex with him way back when, okay? And they thought because of they were tracking her phone, they could keep track of her. Well, you know what she did? Attended a Christian high school and she handed her phone off to her friends for lunch and then she went and had sex with the 26-year-old. So I'm an intrusive parent, which means if my kids are supposed to be someplace, I go see where they are. The other kids know my kid's parent does that. It gives my, my kid something to fall back on in some ways because I'm going to show up and if they're doing something they're not supposed to, I'm going to call them on it. And it gives my kid the backup to say, I can't. You never know when my mom's going to show up. She's crazy. <laughs> you know, if my kid's supposed to be at a church activity, a teen activity, they know I may circle through. And I live 15 miles from the church, and I am still going to drive in and see if my kid's where they're supposed to be. So intrusive parenting is the way to go. Trust but verifies what Reagan said. It ended the Cold War. Imagine what it could do for your families if it ended the Cold War. I don't know. Maybe somebody else needs to make that go because either I've turned it off or there we go. So there are lots of activities that you can do with your kids that are based out of mindfulness, which is a way to calm your mind down, help your kids calm down, because my guess is the number one and two things that your kids are dealing with are anxiety and or depression at a pretty young age, or if they're very young, just lots of high emotion that they don't know how to regulate. So, um, come on. Okay. Very interesting. The handout that you're going to get mailed or, or they're going to put on the website, some, something, it'll get distributed to it, you. It has like 20 different breathing exercises that you can try with your kids. But the amazing thing is breathing exercises actually really reduce your stress and anxiety. They work for you. They will work for your kids. Pretty simple stuff. Deep breath in. The, the key really is in all these different exercises, there's box breathing, all kinds of stuff. The key is breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. If it takes you one, two to breathe in, then take four to breathe out. Everybody try it. Just.
calm you down. I don't want you to do too much of that. You'll fall asleep in here. But breathing exercises work, and they can change your emotions. Uh, all these, I, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, listening to music, huge coping technique. It can help your kids. But here's the key to using music to help your kids. You, you need to hear what the music is about. Angry rap about murdering people may not be the thing you want your kids listening to. And I wish I was kidding, but you need to be listening to their music. My ears were born in the last century, and they like music from the last century. But I am going to listen to what my kids are listening to. If I get in a vehicle, even with my adult kids now, they'll say, hey, that my kids call me Doc. They'll say, Doc? hey, I've got this new song I really like. I want you to hear it. Okay, that's what I want. It's not like I'm going, okay, I've got to hear your music right now. It's taking an interest in what they're listening to and maybe what they like about it. You can open up all kinds of conversations for those social interactions through different conversations about what goes on in a kid's life. The key is you have to ask questions and not talk so much key is you have to ask questions and not talk at your kids. I want you to think about how you talk with your friends. Hopefully you have good friends and you should talk the same way with your children. We somehow get this idea that we're supposed to have a different persona with our kids, but you know, we really want our kids to grow up and be nice people we like. Uh, John Deloney, who's one of the Dave Ramsey personalities, any of you listen to him? Uh, he's one of, okay, he's a former student of mine. Yeah, he, he calls me a transformative figure in his life. Um, I taught a diversity class that he took, and it was his first exposure to being kind to those who are different than you. Um, but John Deloney, you know, he, he and Sheila years ago, he and his wife, when they had tiny children said, we want to raise our children to be people we will like when they are teenagers. I thought, good idea. Good idea. Let's intentionally, and then let's raise them so they're adults we like. You know, isn't it cool when you have adult children if you like seeing them? Now, we can't control everything that goes on. I mean, sometimes our kids make very wrong decisions even if we raise them right. But that should be our goal in raising them. And music can calm. It can also stir up. So we want to know what our kids are listening to and why they're listening to it. Um, okay, this is a technique to use when kids maybe are kind of almost in a panic attack or anxiety about doing something. This 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 technique, I think every counselor in the world knows it, but all of you can use it too. It's not, it's not a secret key, okay? So what you do literally with a kid is you say, okay, I want you to sit here for just a minute, and what I want you to do, it's a distraction, it's what it is, is I want you to tell me five things you can see, Four things you can feel. I mean, you do them slowly because when they're really upset, they're going to have trouble even focusing to tell you what's in the room. And you do it slowly with them. Four things you can feel. Three th things you can hear. Two things you can smell. One thing you can taste. And they come down through the list. And that's very, very calming. So when you're feeling a panic attack, come on, because you're doing a presentation at work, this works for you too. Okay, everything we're covering today works for you as well as for your kids or grandkids. Oh, incidentally... Um, those of you raising grandkids, just know you're not alone. Uh, Grandparent-led households with children have been the fastest-growing households for the last two decades in America. So we have more households that are growing with grandparents raising grandchildren than we do with mom and dad raising children. Growing, I mean the growth rate. Uh, memory games are an effective way to calm somebody down. Now, here's something you need to know as parents that runs counterintuitive to you. Okay, when your kids are very upset, even if you're redirecting, when a kid is very upset, you cannot redirect them. They have to get their brains calmed down. And for some reason, we, we learned, and I'm sure I learned it probably from my parents, we learned this idea that we're going to take care of this right now. Okay, that's not really great parenting when kids are emotionally upset. 
What is great parenting is to distract them and calm them down and come back to it. So that sounds very counterintuitive, but distract, calm, return. That can help your kids more than anything. And memory game is a distraction technique. Listing your favorite things. And in fact, great activity for when you're having dinner together and you don't know what to talk about, let's do something positive. Not tell me what you did at school today. Don't tell me what kid hit you. Don't tell me who you hit. Let's talk about what was the best thing in your day today. What would you like to see happen tomorrow? Let's talk positive things with our kids so they have a more positive mindset. Um, literally visualizing turning down your emotional thermostat. You can teach kids to do this. You can do this yourself. Um, parents who work with me and see me work with a kid in my office who's extremely out of control and won't respond to anything, one of the things parents say to me is, I can't believe you just sat in your chair and stayed so calm. Yeah, what was I supposed to get excited and get the kid more excited? So we have to be a calming presence, turn down our own emotional dials. Okay, I have covered a whole bunch of stuff, and I want to give you guys just a few minutes to ask questions. You'll have access to all these strategies. There's a ton more. I'll send you more. Um, I've got tons of stuff you can use. But do you guys have questions? Questions? Come on, be brave. All of you have perfect kids? Mine aren't perfect. I'm sorry. Pediatricians include TV time with that. It is technology and TV time. Yes, I will. She asked, is the one hour screen time, is that just technology or is that also TV? It includes both. Yes, sir. Uh, that screen time is a little different. Okay, let me differentiate that. That screen time does not have the built-in rewards of gaming, social media, those kind of things. So they are going to get more screen time. Although I will tell you, if you have a neurodiverse kid, which may be ADHD or prenatal exposure, you may even have to limit that. I see a kid where her uh, developmental pediatrician limits her to two 30-minute segments a day in a public school. The public school is putting her on the computer for three hours in third grade. And she was throwing chairs. She stopped throwing chairs when she stopped being on technology for three hours. Yes, ma'am. What if uh, you basically figured out your parent fails in this, uh, <laughs> and they, did you go cold, cold turkey? Do you, uh, I, I would, technology, the food, and the... I, I would do a gradual implementation, okay? <laughs> I, 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 would, I, I wouldn't put them in boot camp, okay? <laughs> it, we, we might talk about some new goals for the year, okay? And, and I would ease into it, okay? Because they can be quite hostile, and there may be more of them than there are you, okay? And it's not, it's not that you've been a parent fail. You've been an uninformed parent. There's a difference, okay? You can't act on information you don't have. So gradual implementation, I would start reducing technology time and having them earn it. Okay, in the very back and then here. Oh, good. What about if technology doesn't work with your kid? What does she like to do? Okay, so here's a, an important part. She said, what do I take away? Because I really took away everything, okay? So here's what you need to know about consequences. Technology was not meaningful for her child. She enjoyed not having it. I would never give it back. Um, but what you do need to do is discover what they enjoy, and what you need to do is make sure they have enough of a taste of it to continue to enjoy it. So you have to be, it's kind of like the biggest checkers game in the world. All right? So I have a lot of parents who, if their kids mess up, they want to take away their swim time for the day. I'm a big believer in swimming in summer because it exhausts your children and makes your life easier. So what I say to parents is, I say, let the kid as a consequence sit out for 30 minutes out of the hour, but let them still swim for 30 minutes that way, swimming is still fun. So don't take everything 
you know, keep, keep it incrementally there so they still want to earn it. Because if you do the whole shutdown and take everything, then it's kind of like entrenched warfare and they're going to try to outlast you. Okay, right over here. What age are your children? No. No, the, the, the horse left the stall a long time ago. Okay? You don't when it comes to technology, and let me tell you why. Okay? I should tell you, I believe all technology goes to bed at night. Okay? If that's all you get for your teens because of where they already are, all technology should go to bed when you go to bed. That means the technology is in your room, as is the Wi-Fi router, as are all the chargers. And I'm not kidding. Technology needs to go to bed at night, and then there would be other times where I gradually re requested their presence at dinner with no technology, those kinds of things to implement it gradually. Okay, and if you change something and it's a positive change for your kids, they're probably going to rebel. So you have to last out the rebellion for the implementation to stick. And the other thing that could happen is if all of you get together as parents here and kind of talk about this, and all the parents at church are doing this, okay? And, and you can always blame me. I'm in Texas. They can try to hunt me down. <laughs> you know, that's the thing about me being a counselor. I'll be honest. There were two or three families that I have worked with through the years where for instance, one of them had a child who had epilepsy and he had five brain surgeries and had nearly lost him. They could not give him a boundary. They just couldn't do it. He was an only child. They waited six years to have him, 16 years to have him. Literally, they came to my office every week and I handed out the consequences for the week because they just couldn't do it. But you're stronger than that. You can do it. Okay, very back. Not if he falls asleep and doesn't use his technology. And if, if it's something where he needs the music, but then the technology stays on all night, you get him an old-fashioned MP3 player, they're still around. So, other questions real quickly, because she's trying to get up here to do a drawing. <laughs> Come on. Gonna I'm going to do the drawing. Is my name in there? One more question. <laughs> No, <laughs> I mean, unless you want to come back to Jonesboro. <laughs> oh, it's something where I could come back to Jonesboro. What is it? Do you want to do one more question? Can I got a question? One? Yeah, they think that y'all should like, go to worship <laughs> we said, service. We said door prize. Everyone's focused. Hey, okay, one more question. There's, there's some information on the end of the slide uh, presentation. I don't know that there is on that handout. The other thing is um, I'm about to start a weekly email. That's my 2024 to parents. I'm going to do a weekly email out to parents. So drbethrobinson.com, when it's up and live, you'll be able to sign up for a weekly email to parents. Hey, let's give Dr. Beth a big round of applause. Thank you. And I saw, I saw lots of people taking pictures. You guys feel free during the next several weeks just to grab your phone and take pictures. We'll also have these printed um, the week following their presentations. And then we also have recordings. So if you already know you're going to be out of town, we'll have those too. So we'll make sure and get you all the information you need. Dr. Beth, today you are drawing for four tickets for the Toby Mac Conference um, in January. So here it is. I would so come back. Did you put my name in here? I didn't, but I can do it real quick. <laughs> I can. Kenna Womack. Yay, Kenna. Okay. Thank y'all for coming. Y'all come introduce yourselves to Dr. Beth or go pick up your kids. <laughs> we love you. Have a good day. We'll see you next week.